A capacitor to inductor converter is shown that is realized with simply two op-amps in this simple circuit. As you can see that we don't have any passive inductor in this circuit, we only have a capacitor load. And somehow when you measure input impedance at port two, it acts like an inductor. If this is true, it's effectively saying that with this simple circuit, we can realize high quality inductors. Uh, and that is something that we can hardly do with passive inductor. So it is practically very useful if it is properly set up this circuit. Let's see how it works. First thing, uh, let's make the assumption that the two op amps that are shown here are in linear region of operation with the proper biasing of the supply voltages. So we have the supply voltage of op amps and let's assume they are properly biased. So virtual short, virtual short is in place for each of the op amps shown. By that, I mean we are assuming that because op amps are in linear region of operation and they are not saturated and their negative feedback is the dominant feedback, then V positive for the positive input terminal of op amp is equal to V negative. Look at the positive input terminal for this op amp. It has a V2 value. Therefore, as a result, the input terminal for negative input terminal has also a voltage V2. Now, what is, what is the outcome of that? We can see that resistor R here has the same voltage drop across as resistor alpha R, because on one side they are connected, on the other side they are both V2. So one thing I can observe then is V R is equal to V alpha R for the resistor alpha R. So, uh, okay, so that means if I X is the current going through R, I can say R times I X is equal to uh, the current that is going through alpha R is I2, because I2 cannot go into the positive input terminal of op amp because that's infinite impedance for ideal op amp. I2 can only flow through alpha R. So therefore, it's uh, alpha R times I2. As a consequence, we get an important relationship that is basically saying uh, I, Ix is simply alpha I2. So let's keep this. This is a super important and useful outcome. Okay, this current IX can only go through resistor R because again, nothing can go through the input terminal of ideal op amp because of infinite impedance. So this IX is flowing this way, going through this resistor, and then, and then continue going through the other R resistor and uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so one thing I can do is I can define the voltage at node Vi. So let's define this node as node. Uh, let's define this node as node Vi, this node here. And I can define V of Vi is equal to uh, just Ix times R plus V2. Okay, so one thing I can write is I can write v of node y is equal to r times ix plus v2. Okay, I'm going to use what I just got from equation one here. So from equation one, conclusion is, and uh, by substituting ix in equation here, that voltage at node y is alpha r i2 times alpha r i2 and then plus v2. Okay, let's keep this. Now, also we can write v uh, voltage at node y using the voltage drop through r, which is uh, by the current i1 passing through r and then v1. So let's uh, also have that in mind. Maybe one thing we, before that, is observation about the, uh, the, the node Y. You can see that, again, the uh, positive and negative input terminal of this second op amp should be equal to each other because of virtual short that I mentioned. Therefore, here we have VY, which is the same thing as VY here. So now, the other observation is the current that goes this way is simply VY divided by R. So this current is VY divide by R. That current is going through this resistor as well. So the voltage drop this across this resistor is simply V by. And because, same idea as the other one, because this resistor and this resistor, they are 
having the same voltage across them. On one side, they're connected. On the other side, they have the same voltage. Therefore, because the value of resistors are the same, they should have the same current flowing through them enforced. So that means this current that I'm going to show in blue, this current that goes through R and then flows up onward. So let me show it this way. This current that goes through R and then flows upward here, that should be equal to uh, Vy over R. So that current is Vy over R. Let me put it this way. This is current I, I by, let's say. So that is I by. Okay, so let's write a KCL at node Y first. So I'm going to do that. KCL at node Y. Give us this. Uh, I Y comes in. And uh, you can see it become I X and I1. So I Y comes in, I X and I1, they're going out. So I1. Okay, let's do uh, utilize the information that we have. Again, I am going to use the fact that Ix is alpha I2. So um, I am going to rewrite this as, um, instead of Iy, let's write Vy over R. So Vy over R is equal to Ix is alpha I2 plus I1. Okay, uh, one um, last thing that I, I can do is on top for the green one, let's do this modification as well. Uh, it is going to help us that divide both sides of this equation by R. So Vy divided by R is equal to alpha I2 plus V2 over R. Okay, uh, keep this as one reference equation. Also keep this one as another important equation, this one that we found here from KCL, um, from KCL. And lastly, let's write one last simple equation. Vy can also be defined as a function of V1. V1, there is a current I1 that flows through R, so Vy is V1 plus R times I1. Okay, so uh, a KVL effectively, you can say. So a KVL effectively says Vy should be equal to uh, I1, or let's say uh, V1 plus Ri1. That's exactly what's happening. V1 plus Ri1. Now divide both sides again with R. So what you're going to get is Vy divided by R is equal to V1 divided by R plus I1. Okay, this is the last needed equation to solve everything here. So let's look at these three equations. I think you already see the trend here. As you can see, when we compare these two equations, we have Vy over R at one side, and on the other side, we have alpha I2, alpha I2, and then we have I1 and V2 over R. So if we name this equation 2, let me use a, a better color so that it's highlighted. So if we use equation, say, if we, if we use equation 2, if we use equation 2, three, we get this. So two, three, give us this outcome that y, V2 over R should be equal to I1. Let's use this as number five. And uh, finally, you can see that by, comp by using three and four now. On one side of 3 and 4, we have Vy over R. On the other side, we have alpha I2 plus I1 and V1 over R plus I1. As a result, alpha I2 should be equal to V1 over R. So uh, by uh, comparing 3 and 4, we get this outcome. 
that we should have uh, V1 over R equal to alpha I2. Let's name this number five. So this is, uh, let's name this number six. This is, by the way, this sort of a, uh, interesting relationship that V2 is defined by, so V2 is defined by I1 and V1 is defined by I2. This is uh, the definition of a gyrator, a very interesting two-port uh, circuit that has this not nominal relationship between the voltage and current of the two ports. Okay, so let's have that in mind. Now, let's just uh, do a substitution. We have a, a seventh equation that is simply relating I1 and V1 using the load. We haven't yet used that. So let's use that as well. Uh, what's gonna, what is the outcome? Okay, I know that uh, V1 is equal to, let me write it here. So V1, and maybe change the color. Okay, V1 is equal to I1 through impedance of cap. So in this case, I1 through impedance of load or cap, which I'm going to then substitute. Okay, so that's equation number, equation number seven. Okay, so let's just start from let's just start from five and six. I can uh, let's just start from this. Let's just start from this. Uh, let's say that the Zn, the input impedance that we want to find, is by definition V2 divided by I2. Okay, let's substitute with all the things we have. Okay, so V2 is I1 over R is Ri1, so Ri1, and uh, this is I2, by the way. Okay, I2 is V1 over, so, so from, from 5, I know V2 is Ri1. From 6, I know I2 is V1 over alpha R, so divide by uh, V1 over alpha R, okay? Now, with the, with the modification here, what I'm going to get is uh, over alpha r, by the way. So r goes to the numerator. It becomes r squared divided by uh, alpha r squared. So we get alpha r squared and then times i1 over v1. Now, you can see that i1 over v1 from equation 7 is 1 over zl. So I'm going to use equation 7. And from there, you can say it's alpha r squared divided by zl. That's the final outcome that I wanted to show we can get to. And it shows that the output impedance is inversely proportional to, sorry, input impedance is inversely proportional to zl. That's the outcome. So we have this interesting observation that z in is equal to alpha r squared divided by zl. Now imagine if I set the zl to uh, set the zl to a cap. So zl is one over cs because cap has an impedance of one over cs. So one over cs in the denominator, cs goes to the numerator, and as a result, you get the desired outcome that zn. So zn. So Zn is alpha r square Cs. That is exactly what uh, the impedance of an inductor is supposed to be. So you can name this as your L because Ls means an inductor. And you're having Zn, input impedance measured in this circuit, is equal to L times S, which means you have an inductor. So uh, this alpha is a parameter of the circuit, meaning that you don't need to change the uh, all the resistor in this circuit. You can only change one, let's say, component if you have a potentiometer instead of this alpha. Alpha R means a potentiometer. If you have a potentiometer there, by adjusting it, you're changing alpha. Therefore, you can control the value of inductor that you're realizing it in this circuit. 
I hope that this is helpful in terms of showing how we can realize this conversion of cap to inductor uh, impedance converter effectively, and uh, effectively also a, a implementation of a gyrator with using two op-amps.